This morning is a, uh, we are starting a two-part series on love, sex, and marriage. And um, I thought I would start first, and then Sharon can come and clean the mess up uh, next week when she shares at all three services. But are you doing well, church? Well, Sharon and I are extremely passionate about marriage. Uh, we want the people at Centerpoint to experience and model all that God has for us in, in this area uh, of our life. You know, I want our church to show the broken world how to do families well. I want us to model it. And, you know, the only way we can do that as a church is if we look at God's Word and use God's Word as the foundation of our relationships and, and, and build upon that. Um, you know, what I'm about to say this morning may not uh, be easy to hear for some of you. Okay, I understand that because depending on our backgrounds, depending on our perspectives, uh, some of what I'm going to say uh, is going to be a little bit challenging. But if you just hear these two things and apply them, uh, you'll be okay. All right? Number one, you need to know that this church loves people because God loves people. And so this message that I'm about to teach is not about putting shame and guilt on you but is speaking the truth in love so that you can be free because it's the truth that sets us free. Amen? And so sometimes if, if, we, if we're living a lie, uh, the truth can be quite offensive to us. But listen, take the truth on board and you'll truly experience freedom. And so that's what we're all about, not perpetuating a lie, but actually teaching what the Word of God says so that you can have freedom in every area of your heart. The second thing I want to encourage you to do is when you come against something that I'm speaking about today that causes you to challenge it, that's good. Don't, don't just blindly agree with everything. But when you have something that challenges you, when the Word of God is preached and something is challenging you, can I encourage you to write down the Scripture verse because everything we teach from this pulpit must come from the Word of God and then go home and research it yourself because we want convictions, amen? We want our hearts to, to be convicted and sometimes if it's, if it's jumping up at us and we're struggling to receive it, fantastic. That's just God's Holy Spirit saying, come on. On, look a little deeper and let me bring that truth to life in you. Amen? Yes. Fantastic. So this morning we're going to look at marriage. And the first scripture is Matthew chapter 19, verse 4. And this is Jesus speaking. He said, Haven't you read that at the beginning the Creator made them male and female and said, For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh, so they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. So whenever we're talking about marriage, we must really go to the Word of God for the foundation. And this is a great foundational scripture of how God sees marriage because it perfectly defines what God's intention was for man and woman, that they would become one together. You see, in, the eyes, in God's eyes, marriage is meant to be a sacred, lifelong covenant, not contract, covenant between a man and a woman that is meant to bring great joy and fulfillment to both partners. Great joy and fulfillment to both partners. And I love that God instituted marriage to be a blessing and not a curse. Yeah. You know, uh, uh, in, in the secular circles, when someone's getting married, uh, the groomsmen and the, uh, the best men gather and say, listen, it's not too late. It's not too late for you to get out of this. You know, I've got a car. We can, we can still, you haven't signed the, the, the contract yet that's going to keep you in prison for the rest. That's the mentality sometimes of the secular world when it comes to marriage. But God says, hey, listen, he who finds a wife finds a good thing. It is a blessing to be married. It is a, it's, a, it's part of your, the plan of God for your fulfillment and for your satisfaction. And more than that, it's supposed to be a sacred and holy covenant. Why is it sacred and holy? Because God is involved. Because God is involved. 
That's why it's sacred and holy. But you might say, hold on, hold on. My husband, my wife, they're not even Christians. That's okay. God is involved when you say, I do. When you take that person as your partner, the Bible says God joins man. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no man separate. If God joins, then the moment we break this covenant, we're actually going against what God has established. And whenever we go against what God has established, we don't receive the blessing that God intended for our lives. In Malachi chapter 2, verse 14, it says this. It is, um, before you read that, actually, well, it's got it up there anyway. But before you read it, um, Malachi, the prophet, is he's, he's, uh, talking to the people of Israel. And they're wheeling, weeping and wailing because God, uh, it seems like God has taken his favor off them. It seems like God's not hearing their prayer anymore. And they're going, why? And Malachi says this, it is because the Lord is the witness between you and the wife of your youth, and you have been unfaithful to her, though she is your partner, the wife of your marriage covenant. Again, in this scripture, it doesn't say it's a man and a woman making a decision or a contract. It says, no, God is involved. God is the witness. God is the one that joins the two together. God is the central character. And no matter what we decide after we have been joined and God has joined us, we don't have a right to separate. We don't have a right to separate. And so uh, that's why, church, we need to understand that, number one, God loves marriage. And number two, God actually hates divorce. And we don't teach that often because in our community, in our society, we want to be sensitive. Of course we do. We love people in this place. And there are people here from all sorts of broken backgrounds. And immediately, right then, your heart may have just restricted and just... Immediately, some people have been, you know, as I said that, uh, the enemy has come and put shame and guilt on you because of your past. Listen, shame and guilt off you. The Bible doesn't say God hates the people who are divorced. It says God hates divorce, the spirit of disunity, the spirit of separation, the spirit of working against what he has joined together. That's what God hates. God will never hate you. God loves you. And it's about time we start to understand that God loves me. Though I am broken, though I have made mistakes, He loves me. You are no more a sinner than I am. We are all saved by grace. We are all in need of restoration and healing. And I'm so glad that our God doesn't keep a record of our wrongs. But when we confess our sins, He is faithful and He is just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So today, if that's your past, no matter what the reason was, God is able to restore. God is able to forgive. And this is a a great saying that I heard from uh, uh, Holly Wagner. She said, no matter what number marriage you're on, whether it's marriage three, marriage one, marriage five, marriage a million, let's make this one last. Let's make this one holy. Let's make this one last a lifetime and let it be a covenant where God is helping us to live out the, the, what he witnessed on our wedding day. Amen? So let's make sure that this one comes under the banner and covering of God's bounty and blessing. So it's extremely important that we understand that divorce is really not meant to be part of our lives. It's not meant to be part of our future. And uh, Sharon and I, when we first got married, we made a a very good decision. uh, And that was a a beautiful boundary in our life. We set the boundary that divorce will never, ever be an option. And by doing that, it actually opened up a whole lot more options for us. Because basically, I was signed in this for life. And so was she. And now, the only option... If divorce is out, all the other options now become more in focus. I now get to choose to forgive or stay miserable. I get to communicate 
and become a better friend and, and, and a lover then, or, or, or stay uh, at distance. All these other options now come to light because the option of divorce is off the table. So marriage counseling, that has become an option. Uh, uh, teaching on marriage, practical teaching, books, alpha marriage course, and all those excellent things. We avail ourselves to these things because divorce is not an option. Forgiveness. Guess what? If divorce was on the table, forgiveness is closed. But because divorce is off the table, forgiveness is a real option. How many know what I'm talking about? Improving in communication and selflessness. That becomes an option because otherwise we stay miserable in our married life because we're in it for life. But God doesn't want that for us. And when we take the option of divorce off because it's not God's plan for our life, every other option opens up in a fresh, new way, so that God's fulfilling uh, blessing can be a part of our life. When divorce is not an option, we change our questions. The question now is, how are we going to make this marriage work? The question now is, how are we going to make this marriage enjoyable for the rest of our lives? That's what we're working on. Loving people takes work. Amen? Amen? Come on, don't be that holy. Some of you are going, really? Oh. Loving people takes work. Sometimes it's hard. This morning, I was running late, and I got my electric toothbrush, and I'm going, the toothpaste should be here. Loving people takes work. It's not on the bench top. So maybe it's in one of the mini cosmetic bags that are on the bench top. Looking through, rub it, not there, okay? Maybe it's under the cupboard, loving people takes work. And I'm, I'm preaching on love, m sex, and marriage. Jesus, help me, help me, Jesus. Going through the cupboard. Of course, it was in the shower where you would keep toothpaste. <laughs> now, don't go and tell Sharon on me because she always tells me when you go and tell her. All right, <laughs> loving people takes work. It takes work. Uh, Danny, there's just a bit of fallback coming back. Can we turn that down just a bit? So we need to understand that the key to a successful marriage is this. Falling in love with the same person again and again. The key to a successful marriage is simply falling in love with the same person again and again. So this morning, I want to teach you six biblical tips on how to fall in love again but with the person you married. Instead of putting your attention elsewhere, let's bring it home. Now, some of our young people are going, well, I'm not even married. Hey, listen, put this in the basket and keep it. Okay, this is something you want to apply in your life now rather than the future. You want to put some of these things into practice now and not the future. Here's what the first tip. Are you ready? Are you ready for this? How to fall in love with your partner again. Number one, the first tip to falling in love again is to get a heart change. To get a heart change. In Mark chapter 10, Jesus was approached by some Pharisees and they came to him and they were trying to test him. They were trying to trap him. And so they asked him a question. Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? Is it right? Is it something we... And Jesus didn't want to come across as one that criticizes the law that Moses gave. And so he said to them, he asked them a question. He says, what did Moses command you? Well, 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 Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and send her away. And this is what Jesus says. Jesus says in Mark chapter 10 verse 5, it was because your hearts were hard that Moses wrote you this law. I love how Jesus doesn't mince his words. He doesn't tiptoe around the tulips. Jesus goes straight at him. You see, sometimes we are looking at our partner and saying, if only they did this, this, and this, it would be easy for me to love them. I would love them. The marriage would be great. My partner, if they only change that bad habit and change that behavior, and we're often looking at the other person and saying, if you change, I will be happy. If you change, the marriage would work. But Jesus doesn't say, hey, listen, don't look at the other person. He says, the reason marriages have conflict, the reason marriages struggle the reason marriages are strained is because you have a hard heart 
deal with your hard heart and the marriage will flourish. Because when your heart is softened by the love and the grace of God, you can't help but to love the person that you are married to. It's a a, 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 a sowing and a reaping almost. But the moment your heart is full of unforgiveness and is hard, it not only shuts off to God, but it shuts off to the very person that God has put by your side and He's joined you together to be absolutely intimate with you. And that's where God says, come on, start with your heart. Change your heart and then your marriage will follow. Change your heart. Let God soften your heart. Repent, in other words. That's the only uh, uh, um, medicine for a hard heart. It's repentance. It's going before God and saying, God, I have blown it. Not my partner has blown it, and because of that, I'm angry. And and because they did this, I am bitter. You know, sometimes we rant and rave at God, and God's not listening because we haven't taken the responsibility to see what is going on in our hearts. We have to look at us and say, you know what? Yes, I'm angry, but why am I angry? So often we're saying, look what you made me do. Look at the black stuff that came out of my heart when you did that. And God's saying, come on, come on. That person just revealed what was in there. See, marriage and relationships are the biggest form of discipleship that you will ever experience in your life. I thought I was perfect until I married Sharon. I thought I was holy and patient and generous and selfless, you know, I walked around with this glow around me until God put this beautiful, kind woman in my life to say, honey, that's just not the right attitude. Don't touch the man of God. God brings relationships in. He brings friendships in so that you can actually see where you're really at. It's through relationship that we are disciples. It's through relationships that we see our flaws. You see, and that's why we're so big on community groups and, and, and connect groups and small groups in this church because some of you are legends in your own lunchbox. You are. You don't know because you're not connected to anyone. You think you're going great. But it's only when you're working with the people that annoy you that you realize I'm lacking patience. I'm lacking forgiveness. And so God says, hey, listen, put them in a group. Put them in a couple and let her, with her different background and her different personality and her different likes and dislikes, come with this guy with his different background and personality. And let's just see the fireworks. Let's just reveal some of the black stuff that is in the heart. God says, hey, listen, soften your heart and you'll fall in love again with your partner. Soften your heart. Go before God and say, Father, I need you to forgive me. I need you to help me forgive them. Father, I need you to soften my heart again so that I have kindness toward them, that I'm not snapping at them all the time. Everything they say, they say something, they ask a question. Oh, they're so annoying, they're always asking. Can I tell you, it's you. The issue is me. Jesus said, stop trying to take the the, the speck out of your brother's eye and ask God to reveal the plank in your own. Because you know what? With a plank in your own eye, every time you look around, all you see is plank. And so you're looking at them and I'm saying, plank, Dan Ying's got plank, 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 Stacey, everyone's got plank but me. Jesus says, come on, it's your hard heart. I don't get it. Front row. I'm just going to ignore it. I'm going to lose track. I've only got a set amount of time. Come on, deal with your heart. Deal with your heart. Let him start with you. And just watch. As that changes how you look at your partner and you fall in love again. The second tip to falling in love again is seeking and speaking truth. Seeking and speaking truth. Matthew 7 says, seek and you will find the truth is what you look for. The truth that you look for is what you'll find. You know, there's the old adage that love is blind. Well, for some of us, love is blind and it's true. And, you know, everything about this person is just so beautiful and he's so smart and he's so clever. Love is blind. But somewhere along the way, love got glasses. <laughs> love got 2020 vision. And love can spot the faults and the flaws a mile away. 
Why? Because all of a sudden, we're seeking for it. Where in the start, we were looking to how beautiful they are. We were looking to convince our parents how great they are. We were looking to convince our friends how great this person is. Now it's like, mm, let me tell you about him. Let me tell you about her. Oh, yeah, sure, they look good right now in front of you in church. But, you know, let me tell you what they're like at home. We've just changed what we were seeking. Seek and you will find. If you look for good things in your partner, you will find it. I am amazed that my wife, after 11 years of marriage, can still find good things about me and keeps, honestly, she's constantly, and I hear her talking about it to other women, to other men, just about Joel and what he does. Joel does this, Joel does that. And because of that, my children respect and honor me with all my flaws, and I see it, and we all see our flaws, sometimes more than anyone else, but my wife can look through all those flaws and find good things in me that stir me up to be a greater man. Instead of looking for the flaws that draw the attention of the person who's struggling to their weakness and focus on that, we should draw it to the strengths that caused us to fall in love in the first place. And the Bible then goes on to say that death and life are in the power of the tongue. Once you've sought it and you find it, make sure you brag about it. Make sure you declare it. Make sure you speak of it. Women, when you get together and every other woman is talking bad about her husband, you turn the conversation around. You turn the atmosphere around. Don't you put your amen and I agree with what they're saying. Tell them something different about your husband. Tell them how to look with their husband with honor and respect. Tell them how to build their husband. Well, husbands, when you hang around the guys and you're all bagging their wives out, put a, put a guard on your mouth. Say, no way, I'm going to honor and respect my wife before these men. That's what, uh, uh, it helps you because I believe that when you start to speak these truths out, you hear them more than anyone else. And you start to believe and focus on what you're hearing. And it changes your heart toward them. And you begin to fall in love again with the partner that God has brought and joined you to. Research from the University of Denver studied newly wed couples. And over the first decade of marriage, they found very subtle but telling differences at the beginning of the relationships. Among couples who would ultimately stay together, five out of every 100 comments made about each other were put-downs. But among couples who would later split, 10 out of every 100 comments were insults. The gap magnified over the following decade until couples heading downhill were flinging five times as many cruel and invalidating comments at each other as happy couples were. Let's take a stock take on our speech, church. Let's take a stock take on our speech. Sometimes we're not criticizing but we're not also building up. Do you know what I mean? Some of you fathers, you know, it's easy to tell your children off and to direct them and give them instruction, but can we also then speak life, encourage them about what they're doing great, things that they can't see themselves and draw it out of them? By speaking correctly, by seeking and speaking truth, we fall in love again with our partner. Number three, the third tip to falling in love again is simply making time. Is simply making time. When it comes to time, we all fool ourselves into thinking that quality is better than quantity. That's a lie. That's actually a lie. For a good relationship to build and establish, time in quantity is important. All the research tells us that. And our most valuable asset, the, the asset that's most precious to us in this life is our time. And as the world gets busier, as the world gets busier, we tend to invest in those things that are not as important as the most important thing, which is our family. You know, Harry Truman, the, the president of the United States, would write a letter to his wife every single night he was away from her. And they gathered all these letters, and they're in a museum. And we think, well, we're so busy. He was running the U.S. Do you know what I'm saying, church? It's just a difference in priorities. And what you prioritize and what you value, you tend to invest your time in. Can I encourage you, especially the men in this house, make time. Make time. And it's got to be undistracted. 
turn off the Facebook, I'm guilty, turn off the mobile phone, turn off the TV, put the newspaper down and look at your wife. It's a lost art almost, isn't it? We'd rather text each other and message each other. But just holding your wife, looking into her eyes and just spending time will build that relationship again. Amen? How to fall in love again? Spend time. Fifth thing. Fourth thing. Where's fourth? Yeah, that's right. The fourth tip to falling in love again is loving your partner in a way that meets their needs. Ooh, okay. Let's look at this. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In this particular scripture here, we see how Jesus loved the church. Jesus looked out at the needs of the bride. He looked out at what the bride needed the most. What we needed the most, church, was forgiveness. What we needed the most was purifying. What we needed the most was washing. And so Jesus looked out at the needs of the bride, his partner, and he saw the needs and he gave himself to meet those needs. Sometimes when we love our wives, we love them according to our love language. We love them according to what we need, you know, and often they're going without feeling love because they're actually carrying a need. Husbands especially, we are to open our eyes. We need to train ourselves in opening our eyes. I shared with you that sometimes wives need to speak uh, and tell us because we're just dumb. Uh, we're a bit but like barbarians sometimes, and wives, they use a lot of uh, 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 hints. That's probably the best way to go. You know what I'm talking about? <sighs> huh, she's breathing. <laughs> she's alive. Praise Jesus. You know, and, and sometimes wives just need to be logical and, and cut through the emotional stuff and actually tell us what we need to do. And we're more than happy to do it. But husbands, sometimes we just need to open our eyes and see the needs. Can I tell you some needs that your wife will probably not ask you for? Sometimes they just need you to reaffirm them that they're a good wife, that they're doing a great job, that you love them. Sometimes they just need a cuddle without needing to be asked. They just need your big strong arms to come around them and just hold them. Just as Jesus said he did to the city of Jerusalem, how he longed to just wrap his arms around them. Sometimes your wife just needs that. Sometimes it's actually physical work. I, I, without going too much into it and all the single people close your ears, but one of the greatest turn-ons for wives, they say, is the husband filling that dishwasher. Helping out with the house. And the wife's like, he loves me. He, look, that man, look at the strong arms. And it's like, come on. I'm going to put this dishes in the dishwasher. Baby, are you watching? Do you want me to take my shirt off? I'm putting these dishes in the dishwasher. And I'm setting it on high, baby. Shutting the door. And the wife's like, oh. <laughs> she has a need. She has a need. She has a need and the husband noticed. The piling dishes <sighs> didn't go unnoticed. But the husband saw the need and sacrificed of himself. That's exactly what Jesus Christ did for us. When we open our eyes to see the need she has and meet that need, it screams, I love you. And it helps your partner fall in love with you all over again. The fifth tip falling in love again. Understand the spiritual function of sex. Oh, he said the S word. It's quite funny. Some of the young guys are on kids ministry this week and they're, Pastor Joel, I'm going to miss out. I said, you never come to me when I'm talking about faith and generosity and fasting. You don't care, but you're talking about sex and it's like, oh, we're going to miss out. See, the Bible tells us that sex is much more than a physical act. It's actually a spiritual joining agent. It is glue to a marriage. 
And it's meant to draw two peoples who are separate and bring them together in one flesh. You see, in our world, you become married. Two become one when they sign papers and give it to the government. But in God's eyes, two only become one when they consummate their marriage. That's when two become one. See, sex is meant to be this glue and this joining agent. And some of us in this room need to understand the importance and the spiritual function of sex. We have taken what the world says about sex and we've adapted what it believes. But if we just realize the power of it to make a husband fall in love with his wife again and to make a wife fall in love with her husband again. This is, it's so important that the church understands the power of sex because unless we do, we won't be able to uh, help our young people realize why sex outside of marriage is, is such a disastrous thing. Because unless you realize that God intended for it to be a super glue that joins two people together, and the only way that you can rip it apart is with a lot of pain and a lot of emotional hurt. And so that's why God says, hey, listen, don't do it out of marriage. But can I say, the Bible actually commands in marriage that you do it. Yeah, it actually says, do not withdraw your body from each other unless it's for a short time and you better be praying and fasting. That's what the scripture says. Only for a short time of prayer and fasting can you stop. But then make sure you apply glue to keep the two one. And it's really important that we understand that. But here's the thing. Men need to understand that women need to feel loved to give love. And so men need to keep their eyes open to sowing into their relationship and helping their wife to feel loved and have their needs met. But women, you also need to understand that when men receive sexual intimacy, they feel love and valued. So when you reject them of that, you are actually rejecting them of your love. That's how important sex is in marriage. We cannot downplay it because it's actually the cause of a lot of marital conflict. And here's the other thing. You're the only ones who are able to meet that need in your partner. God picked one person to meet that need in their partner. And if you don't fulfill it, one day we will be accountable because it was something that was given to us only for our partner's benefit. And so it's really important that we realize, amen? All the men said, amen, but in their hearts quietly. All right. The sixth and final tip as the musicians join up to falling in love again is leaving and cleaving. In Matthew 19, it talks about leaving your parents and cleaving or joining with your partner. Do you know, they cannot be cleaving. Hear me, church. They cannot be cleaving unless there's leaving. And I'm not just talking about your parents. I'm not just talking about your mother and father. But if there is no leaving of bachelorhood, no leaving of, of, of the friends that made me mates, if there's no leaving of family responsibility to your parents, and your, then they can never be cleaving. And so many people are trying to cleave, but in the middle of their cleaving is past things that haven't been left. So the family gets involved. Can I, can I, I love my family. I love my family, but nothing comes between my wife and I. I love my boys. I love my boys. But even my boys, you can ask them who daddy loves the most. We try to, we, Sharon and I, we hug in front of our boys all the time and we kiss in front of our boys all the time and they'll try to get in there and they'll try to push, you know, I don't know if you've got, my boys are a bit like that. They're crazy. They'll stop eating. They'll stop watching TV. They'll stop playing Xbox to get in and into the, the mum and dad cuddle. It's, it's just weird. And, um, but in all of that, you know, Sharon and I are trying to keep them out. You know, we're just playing, we, we play this game. It's like wrestling Chalaya style. And, um, but they need to know. She needs to know that she is number one. I need to know that in her heart, I'm number one, that she is willing to leave all else, that I am living, willing to leave ministry. I'm willing to leave you all for my wife. And I've told her that. And in that stability and security, 
is great trust and an ability for us to truly love one another. Church, if you're in this place and you're struggling, because I've just shared with you, you've made a lifetime commitment and some of you feel like, oh man, where to from here? The love has gone out of our marriage. What can I tell you? By the grace of God, you can fall in love again. You can fall in love again with your partner. But for some of us, we have to leave some things. For some of us, we have to leave the affections of another person, a person at work. For some of us, we have to leave the affections of our computer and our ministry and our family to cleave wholeheartedly, to make this marriage more than just work, but thoroughly enjoyable fulfilling and blessing. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes and put away your notes?